One thing about Cody, it's like it was when I first started preaching. A lot of other guys, we begged to preach or read. We didn't care what we were doing. And uh, so when you get older, you realize you don't have to do it that way. But there they are. They're both free, and they're going to read the Word of God to us. Glad you guys could be here. Good morning, church. Morning. It's good to see everybody. Um, we're going to be reading Psalm 31. I'll start and then Cody will finish. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress, and for your name's sake you lead me and guide me. You take me out of the net they have hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. I hate those who pay regard to worthless idols, but I trust in the Lord. I will rejoice and be glad in your steadfast love, because you have seen my affliction. You have known the distress of my soul, and you have not delivered me into the hand of the enemy. You have set my feet in a broad place. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasted from grief, my soul and my body also. For my life is spent with sorrow, and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity. Because of all my adversaries, I have become a reproach, especially to my neighbors, and an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. I have been forgotten like one who is dead. I have become like a broken vessel, for I hear the whispering of many, terror on every side, as they scheme together against me, as they plot to take my life. But I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from my persecutors. Make your face shine on your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. O Lord, let me not be put to shame, for I call upon you. Let the wicked be put to shame. Let them go silently in Sheol. Let the lying lips be mute, which speak instantly, against the righteous in pride and content. Oh, how abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you and worked for those who take refuge in you in the sight of the children of mankind. In the cover of your presence, you hide them from the plots of men. You store them in your shelter from the strife of tongues. Blessed be the Lord, for he has wondrously shown his steadfast love to me when I was in a besieged city. I had said in my alarm, I am cut off from your sight, but you heard the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cried to you for help. Love the Lord, all you his saints. The Lord preserves the faithful, but abundantly repays the one who acts in pride. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and hearing of this word. Let me just tell you that uh, for those that haven't been here, the last time we did communion, we're doing it a little different, so let me explain what we're going to do so you will know. Those that have been here, we're going to do it the same way we did it last time. And we're going to keep doing it that way until we get through this, whatever we're going through. How many of you know that uh, there's a lot of weird and crazy stuff going on in these United States of America? And uh, the good news uh, that Pastor prayed this morning is that he will never leave us nor forsake us, right? It's good in all this stuff going on to know that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But this has changed a little bit. And so here's what we're going to do, just so you'll know. Uh, we're going to try to maintain social distancing. Now, for you guys that are already hugging and shaking hands, I know that doesn't mean anything to you. 
But for the rest of you who are trying to maintain social distancing, we're going to do that through this process. So after I pray over the elements, we'd like you to come up by rolls, first roll first, and you'll notice that the bread is already cut, and it was cut this morning with gloves on very safely, and it's already got a toothpick in it, so just take your toothpick and bread, dip it in the fruit of the juice there, and then eat it and put the little uh, toothpick in the little toothpick things there. And we even have an example so you'll know where they go. And then return to your seat. The next roll will come up when it's socially uh, spaced to do so. There will not be a rover so we don't get too close to you. Uh, but other than that, that's the way we're going to do it right now. Uh, so I'd like to read some scripture first. Before we start, before I pray, you know, there's a lot of things that don't change, but this has a shelf life. Did you know that? Communion has a shelf life. When I go in and I get uh, the milk at, at Kroger or HEB, I always look at what's the expiration date, and I get the, most, the one with the longest expiration date. This has an expiration date. Did you know that? Today may be the last day ever that we take communion. Because scripture says we do that until he comes again. What if we're the last body of believers that get to take communion before we hear the trumpet and he comes again? Wouldn't that be neat? Wouldn't that be neat? So let me read some scripture where it says Paul is talking to the, uh, those Yehus in Corinth, who are saints, by the way, but they weren't acting like it. And he has just uh, told them, because of what they were doing at the communion supper, shall I commend this to you? No, I will not. So he's just kind of given them a little bit of a, a, a tongue lashing there. For he says, For I have received from the Lord what I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And he's coming. I don't know when he's coming, but he's coming back. So no matter what you see going on in these United States of America and the world, know this, us as believers, Jesus one day is coming again to receive his church. And you don't have to worry about that. He's coming again. So I'm going to bless this, and, and then we're going to come up for communion. Father, uh, what a privilege to do communion. You know we do it twice a month at least, and uh, we know uh, some churches do it more, some do it less. That's not the issue. The issue is, Father, that we recognize, as, as, as Jesus said when he broke the bread, this represented my body which was broken for us. And so we look at that cross, not on the cross now, but what he did on the cross, that body broken. And we look at the blood that was shed for without the shedding of blood, Hebrews says, there's not forgiveness of sin. So he was the perfect sacrifice. And we recognize this in this little ceremony that we do, Lord. And yet it's so big and so important. And may we never come up here without looking at ourselves and examining ourselves, as Paul tells us to do, so that we know what you have done uh, for us. This is a uh, table for believers, Lord. We recognize that, that. Everybody who is a believer comes not a member of this local body, but a believer in the Lord Jesus, the member of your body. And so we come today to celebrate 
the death, the burial, the resurrection, the gospel, our Savior. And so we ask you to bless it as we look to you and praise you in the sweet name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's come, saints, and take communion. Probably most of us in the past quite a few weeks now have uh, found ourselves at times just maybe standing outside or looking at what's going on and you just feel the weight of it. The weight of what's happening in people's lives and the weight of what's going on in our nation. The weight of what's going on around us and other places. It's like a worldwide thing, it seems, trying to fight its way across. It's not the first time that uh, troubles have come, maybe the first time that some of these troubles have appeared in America, which makes it only harder to stay put, to stay committedly put, to reach out and touch people, set a goal for yourself to just be an instrument of grace, to be ready to be used by God in what's transpiring. The God we serve is light, and in him is no darkness at all. No darkness at all. He's the light of the world. That's pretty inclusive when you start thinking about it. He brings illumination. He brings change when he enters a life or a town or a church or even a bunch of pastors who have their set way of doing things and their sense of the way it ought to be and we can get that way so quickly. Start measuring how to do what we can do in this part of the life of the church because of the way we did it 
30, 40 years ago. I felt the weight. Felt the weight physically, felt the weight spiritually, felt the weight. And sometimes the weight is weighty. Sometimes it feels weighty. Sometimes it is weighty. I remember that he has rescued us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And I am freshly reminded all the time that when he comes, he comes to save. He comes to save. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And regardless of time, there are lost people around who need to hear that gospel message. Just remember, and let me say it again, when God touches a nation, a church, an individual soul, here's the cry that goes up from that church when they recognize what's going on. That individual, when he recognizes what's happening, arise, shine, for the Lord has come. It's not some place to rest. It's not just another soft place to sit back and hope nobody gets this stuff to us. Did you think about it like I did, that you might just take that thing into your body and be sick with it? Because lots of people were. Lots were. I'm just thankful, Lord. I said, I didn't even ask for safety or keeping or any of that. I know he, what he promised in his word. You don't have to make up that part. He's taking care of us. He's guiding us. He's blessing us. He's keeping us. When it's time to represent him, the time is usually tough. But the representation is significant and important when we step into it all the time. Risen upon you is the son of righteousness with healing in his wings, Malachi writes. Risen upon you. Someone said, and I can't remember who said it. I, do you ever watch a guy on, on the, the radio station? He comes on, he's got a big fuzzy looking beard. He's got all kinds of color combinations in his clothes. And he's a book guy. And that got my attention. So when he's a book guy, I stop by. I want to see what he dresses like and looks like. He's, he's showing us everything he's got behind the counter. It's a, it's a little light helps me in the dark. And I mean, he's, he's an old guy. He said, we got some new, some new used books in, folks. Now to stop by here on this, at this spot and let's talk about them. And then he got to telling us about his wife who had two more nights to work and then she was going to be retired. And he got lost almost in that, came back to it. But I heard him say, he, he said what he was reading from John Piper. Everybody here familiar with John Piper? John Piper is a longtime pastor who is uh, preaching in and everywhere he can all the time for a lot of years. And he has a word of God that's pretty clear and pretty potent. And he's not been afraid to share it. He's quoting John Piper and right alongside of him, he's got Annie Dillard. Anybody here familiar with Annie Dillard? Now, Annie doesn't claim to be a Christian, but Annie writes beautifully. Annie reaches deep into what she writes about. Don't go to her door and ask her if she can help you get saved because she's not a Christian. She'll help you in her way, but she doesn't know. She won a Pulitzer Prize in writing in, at 25 years old. A Pulitzer. I thought maybe somebody would read my article. I mean, you know, maybe that'd be better. Somebody could read my article or maybe somebody would get a couple of copies of it, pass it around, and I am on the way. She gets a Pulitzer, 25 years old, 300 pages, and she's observing a creek. A creek. Pilgrim at Tinker Creek is the name of it. And she records every little thing, watching frogs, bugs, little animals, trees, Everything she can find, she'll camp out there at night to catch a certain process taking place in the changing world that she's looking at. I thought, man, I'm not that patient. I could not do that. But he put these two together, this old man did, and got my attention. 
He said, now this Annie Dillard, I like Annie. I've read Annie for a long, long time. Annie's not a Christian, but Annie's, Annie knows what she's doing when it comes to writing. Then he holds up this great big, I know he's got bad sight because every book he picks up, it's an extra large type size. I mean, it's big. So he picks up this next book and he, and he said, this John Piper, let me read a little bit of it. Now I was, I was not able to hear all the little bits of it, but I heard enough to inspire me to write those names down so I, I have them left over from my studies right here. I'm going to work on them a little bit. But when I, when I saw what he was doing, he said, you know, there's more significantly the same between Andy Dillard and Piper than you might think. Now, we're not putting Christian against non-Christian. We're simply saying they're seeing something that I think they're right about. They go and they watch the, they watch the moon as it, as it kind of comes up. That's what we say, it comes up and wherever it is. It's coming up and it's coming over. And when you first see a moon, full moon especially, as it begins to get bright, you notice how bright it can get? And, and, and all kinds of things in that, in that atmosphere of that kind of world. And so you see all kinds of colors, all kinds of sights, all kinds of things. And this old man said, you know what it is? Piper's right. He said, if you sit there long enough and look, you'll see beyond the world's images you will see it's living and alive and real. From God, this is telling us something about God. And it wasn't Annie doing it, but Piper knows how to see it. When there is a world full of anger and darkness, it's time to slow down and look at what's going on around you. It's time to see if you can figure out what is it that God wants to do with this time and this place and this situation as we walk on from here as his. I don't use dark night of the soul very often, although I have in one session, at least one period of time in my life, through even while I was pastoring, wrestled with that over a period of weeks. I called it the dark night of the soul because it just laid down heavy on my soul and my life. But this thick darkness, this thick darkness has been around a while. Have you read enough of the Old Testament to see it show up every now and then, this thick darkness? Have you talked to Israel and their journey at different times and asked them when they encountered a thick darkness, this darkness that just took them in? Well, you know, when they got through trying to stay in their own land, they went on exile run. Was that a dark night? Oh, my goodness. They sat down by the rivers there in that foreign place and wept over their circumstances. I've wept over less, but I'm only one human being who's learning to recognize that God is really there. He's really working, has things to do. I'm told that all the time. I have wonderful help from my family and from you who are here as part of this church and others that know me, call me because they want to make sure of what's going on in their own life sometimes. This thick darkness encounters God, this God who is without shadow as he reveals himself at times. This God that we felt so heavy dealing with our soul and our heart, we now see him lifting his people higher all the time. You're, some of you will remember, you remember how, how, it's been a few years back now that we actually did a series oh, on, on being lifted into the heavenlies on worship on Sunday morning. Anybody remember that? Yeah, I still have the guy, uh, one of the guy's books that I read in Regent, and he's a, he's a guy that it was just interesting, you know, because here you just are being lifted up to worship. Jesus is the worship leader in his church is how these fellows from down, what, what were they, what was their city? What was it? It's that good old uh, historic Christian communities along seminaries with beautiful work. But they taught it, and it's true. When you come to church on Sunday and you're, 
looking up to God, Jesus Christ leads you to worship. He is the, the song leader, the worship leader. And we tried to, to pull that into us a little bit during those days. A series of messages that actually told us this is what we do. We don't sit down here and eat cookies. We stand over here and are lifted up into the presence of God. And our people were standing with their hands up more than once because we acknowledged what we were doing. We didn't make that the key. We made the awareness that Jesus Christ is in his holy place. The Father's own Son. The worship leader of the people of God. God's own people. It's an amazing thing what God can do in some of those places, those situations. The darkness of history is evident. It's chaotic, confused at times, fear producing so much. And in the middle of that association of darkness is a loving providence. A loving God. He's, he's there. But pastor, it's really dark. Don't matter. If God leads you in, he will keep you in. Bring you out. A loving providence in the middle of where the dark is. A father almighty where the dark is. What about all the darkness shadowing us in the process? Shadowing. Not possessing. Not holding. In Israel, a terrible, thick darkness came. And Zephaniah talked about it in that first chapter of Zephaniah in the, New, in the Old Testament, verses 14, 15, 16, if you want to look that up sometime, not now. Israel is considered as a, a, a terrible, thick darkness coming upon them. When all the glory of the Exodus, all the majesty of David, all the dreams of the prophets seemed utterly eclipsed. They were overcome, it seems. Israel knew that route quite a bit. But they weren't going to be let go because God works in exile or disintegration or lostness or blackness. God works. By the rivers of Babylon, they sat down and wept. They were taunted. Now, weeping in this place over your lost place, where is now your God? Certainly not in Babylon. They couldn't see that he was still there. And then as they waited and watched and listened to their prophet, Jeremiah, they heard him as he spoke, as he understood, as he saw that God had a plan right then too. What was it? Oh, try 31st chapter of Jeremiah. Don't miss that one because when you get there, you hear about what God's going to do to build and make his people what they are. Yeah, but we want to see all our... No, you won't see that. You'll see inside when he reveals himself. But it's going to be something that cannot be taken away, won't be pushed in. He's going to be there with the Spirit of God coming out of him, flowing in every one of those who follow him, that Spirit of God is a marvelous thing. That was an accident. <laughs> they discovered God had a plan. Jeremiah sees a future day when God will write his law in human hearts, and they will all know me, and I'll remember their sin not again. Is that good? Oh, my goodness. God is working in us even now bring us to attention before those things we've refused so far to acknowledge and he will help us see. Caesar in Rome was understandable. Those guys ruled. The Caesar was the Lord. The old Caesar, the Lord, and under that flag he would do his thing and it was pretty bad most of the time as, that, as their history progressed. Israel, though, was a vassal state. Wasn't going to help them much. They weren't politically placed in the politics that went on with those others. And 
their place was a national non-entity. They didn't have a nation acceptable to Rome. They didn't have a God acceptable to Rome. Caesar is Lord. Israel's politicians were appeasers when you read through and catch their whole story. The priests were secularist. Israel's prophets were casuist. Israel's leaders were ready for the massacre of the innocents. I'm just following them down. Does anybody remember when the massacre of the innocents was? What was that about? That was about a killing of a whole bunch of under two-year-old little boys. It came right into Israel's history. They were being pushed along to acknowledge the Caesar. They were being pushed along to do a lot of things and they had no opposing power to them. Not any. And the, gay, and the baby came to Bethlehem. And the working man came to Nazareth. And he came into his own and his own received him not. They said, we have no king but Caesar. God's people. God's chosen people. All they have is a unanimous vote for Barnabas, or for Barabbas against Jesus, the sordid squalor of the execution squad on the hill of Golgotha with the sun hiding its face for every shame and darkness at noon over all the land. Hmm. The thick darkness where God was opened finally, eventually, to revelation and the resurrection and its power and authority. Moving on into the New Testament, it becomes a powerful place. The thick darkness where God was does not hold or win. Let us believe our own faith. Let us believe our own faith that the God who came to Israel through the dark place in the exile, the God who was reconciling the world to himself in the thick darkness of Calvary is not discerning, is not deserting the world stumbling through these shadows. He's not. He's working in it. The basic fact of history is not an iron curtain but a torn veil when it ripped from the top to the bottom in the most glorious reality that, the, that those people had up to that time. They had history, but they had here a God who could destroy the bondage over them, set them free. The basic fact of history is not Iron Curtain, but the torn veil, the devil's strategy but the divine sovereignty wins over that. Amen. Lift up your hearts. It's a good day to worship. A little bit more personal, a little more close to home for some of us. The dark night of the soul comes sometimes in the failure of a, of a marriage or the failure of a business. Christians suffering things that have really whipped on them. Shattered relationships are often, there's the onset of pain, there's the breakup of a home, there's the desolation of bereavement that comes, whacking us down. There's also the eclipse of faith when a person, quote, in their own minds loses the faith they had in Jesus. How many of you know that might be the worst, should be, the worst sense of loss among all this. It has to do with the heart connected to God and torn out is the pain of it. Wretched feeling of meaninglessness, emptiness, futility, pervading everything. We start questioning all the pieces of the faith. Now, first thing you can say about the faith when you use it like that, you're just talking about the whole body of truth related to the gospel and to the faith that's in Jesus Christ. It's called the faith. 
if you're preaching it, part of it, you're preaching parts of the faith, gospel, which is also identifying with the faith along the way. Are there not days when life gets you down? Aren't there days when the wear and tear takes the toll and the hallelujahs of the saints gets a little irritating? You know, you get around certain folks and hallelujah, praise the Lord, God's good. I want that. I love that. I grew up with that. But if anybody called you out and stands you up and says, now, what do you, get, what do you mean by that? You just know then the next time to start at a little different place in your joy. You get there, though. You get there. The hallelujahs of the saints. The means of grace seems to be stale and flat. And almost all of us have had these kinds of experiences, no matter, some of them hard, some of them very hard, but difficult. I remember Jacob in the Kidron Valley wrestling at a dark place where God was, a certain valley. And he wakes up the next morning and he knew in the morning he'd been wrestling with God. He didn't have a doubt about it. Wrestling with God. And he limped on with his new name. He limped on with his new name. Brother Jacob, there he was, prince with God. Prince of God. Wow. Here in the darkness of sin, and we often don't talk about great darkness associated with sin, but we need that again. Is this sin? Well, yeah, probably. But when you know it's sin and the way is dark, just remember that some love darkness because their deeds are evil. That would be sin being accomplished in their lives. Some want to hide, so they make their bed and shield, hide, and there they are, found out. That's the way it is. Judas betrayed him. And when he went out, the scripture says it was night. Thick darkness where God was is what he stepped into. That's the opportunity to be taught something. He rebelled. He died. Cost him. Judas, a betrayer, went out and it was night. I also was reading this week just brief parts of it because the language slows me down and that's the uh, hound of heaven. Anybody familiar with the hound of heaven? Pretty good, pretty good words in there. I mean, it's well written. It's short. But you won't read it just before you take your first bite of food at home in the lunchtime. You'll probably want to have a little more time than that. The Hound of Heaven, Francis Thompson. And all he was talking about was that God is always the one doing the chasing. That somebody is looking for you and it's not you. It's the Holy God. You're here in the darkness trying to figure out why in the world he's coming after you now. And then there he is, the hound of heaven. Hound of heaven. Thick darkness where God was. This is where judgment, though, turns to mercy. How do you get mercy in all this judgment? Mercy in all this darkness? How do you get to be a place where you're merciful and you're part of a merciful people? who tend to love you like that because of it. Well, let me just tell you what I mean with that. This is where the hound of heaven becomes the law that will not let you go. What law is that? Love, it's love. Hang on to Jesus and read the New Testament and you'll find it quite a bit about him being the one who loves you. And here he is. This is where the hound of heaven becomes the love that will not let us go if I make my bed in hell, you are there. See, there it is. That's salvation. When you make your bed into Sheol, 
He loses his grip on you. Even if you put your pursued one to sleep, you're going to wake up soon and discover that he needs help, and there it's going to be. Remember, Peter, the dark night of Jesus' betrayal, it's precisely because God was in that darkness that he came through. God was in that darkness on the night that Jesus had been crucified. In that darkness. Wow. I like that. God was in the darkness, that he, he came through the darkness, not as an outcast, but as an apostle. Now, there's some work being done, but he'll get it done. He's going to be that man. Or because God was in Paul's fall, we fell on the Damascus Road, remember, fell off his horse. Some, some usually say, because that's what it says clearly. He emerged not a soul in hell, but a saint of heaven. He came out the other side, worked on by God as well. Made ready to walk with Jesus. He spent his life walking with Jesus. In the darkness where God is, is the potential of God working that cannot be overcome nor stopped. Amen. Cannot be. I've stood around a lot of ca uh, caskets and I can tell you it's not easy for people. Um, we started complaining about some of the way funeral directors did their work with caskets because it was always a manipulation. And I say that with pretty much a sense of that being true. Because what they would do would take someone who could hardly stand the loss, someone who just lost a loved one, someone I know very well and cared for a long time that she'd been gone now a long time too, and her husband and her son, gone. But through the years when I did have opportunity, she always was so moved, you know, and she'd call her son's name and mention he would like that. And he's, he hasn't had much in, in life, so we need to get him the best casket we can. One that's going to cost you $8,000 just for the casket. That's when every one of those people going to the funeral home should have taken their pastor along. Don't take your husband. Don't take somebody that loves you and walks with you all the time and has the same loss. Take your pastor, tell him what you need, and he'll control the numbers up. And I think that's the smartest way to do it. Loving people enough to sit down and say, no, 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 you don't want to buy it. And that's what happened with this lady, finally. Because there was a helper in the funeral home who came alongside me and said, your pastor's right, you don't want to spend all that extra money. It's the same no matter what you spend on the outside. It's knowing that he's Jesus' child that counts. It had its moments of thanksgiving. She loved Jesus with all her heart. She wanted to do what her son would enjoy. She wanted to do what she thought was loving and blessed. His body went in the ground. Where all the other members of her family, every one of which she had paid for their funerals up to the, her own home doing. She went home to be with Jesus. The thick darkness is overcome so many times where God is, where he comes, where he works. Many people today don't want to talk about death or dying, and I know that. Why should we let that somber shadow of the future cloud the bright sunshine of the here and now? Enjoy today's day with him. Now is Christ risen from the dead. And we are raised with him. Death is a darkness, a hard place. I've had people come to me and say, Pastor, this, this people, I knew, I knew, very little about the lady who had died. I knew a little more about her husband, her friends connected, and they were not, they were not old. 
She died at approximately 40. And sent a messenger to me somehow or another from her husband to tell me, we don't want to tell them about some of this. We don't want them to know. In other words, if you're going to do the funeral, you've got to say things that aren't true. I said, you want to get up and celebrate while the woman is dead? Yeah, they wanted to dance and celebrate and have exciting times. I said, I can't do that. I will speak the truth because we love you and love them. And God took it in his hand. And the anointing was so rich on the lives of those that were there, the celebration stayed in the heart and came out through the mouth with praise and thanksgiving. And thanks for doing that, Pastor. That's as good as it gets. And we forgot about it after that because we didn't have to do it. We heard God speak. I remember the day that Debbie wanted her dress on. This was a dress-up day for Debbie. We knew it. She had told us, made it clear that day to her sister, certainly. And she was getting ready to go meet Jesus. Every day was different from that. She had certain kinds of clothes she wore, certain pants she liked to put on. Had all those things, were comfortable. But she was dressing up for Jesus. That was... That was a great story. I thought, this is a great thing. It's not just a great thing. This is the life of Debbie. This is the life her family knows she lives. So what happened first is she got prepared in her dress. We all sang a song, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know, and kept on singing for a little bit. And then, I, I didn't do it like this in my, in my uh, notes here. I have prepar Debbie, preparation, song. I didn't say church or home. I said Jesus. Preparation, song, the presence of Jesus. Did he come? Oh, did he come? Did he take Debbie or Lee? Oh, he took her. You think she's going to stay here when Jesus he dressed for and sang for and longs for is going to come right down and receive her? No, she was ready. And we weren't, but she was ready. And we watched an unfolding response to that every time we have a, an anniversary day of it. We get to say it again. What a beautiful spirit. What a glorious day. Wow. And then the day came that she must go. Time was up. And accompanied by her friend, she went to the riverside. And I'm making this part up. She went to the river. You know, if you read Bunyan's book, you've got a river to cross somewhere down through there near the end of the events. I like a lot of the statements in that book, and especially a bunch of them near the end of the text. But I like this too. This is fine. Many accompanied her to the riverside, into which she went, and then she said, Death, where is thy sting? And as she went down a little deeper, she said, Grave, where is thy victory? Here's the report. So she passed over. And all the trumpets sounded for her on the other side of the river. <laughs> wow. Makes it a good time to laugh and a good time to cry, a good time to celebrate. One of the finest lives I've ever met in my life. And a family to go with it. Loving Jesus. Listen, saints. The darkness is not going to win. That big cloud of darkness that's pounding us now and putting us to the place where we can't think very well or those kinds of things, we're going to keep on walking and keep on talking until we know we're through. And we're going to turn around and say, You have been defeated, devil, in the name of Jesus Christ. 
Because he is the one who's given you life. He even let Cody and Mandy out of their lockup, you know, to be able to come and join us. Alive and good well. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray. Just with our hearts quiet for a minute, just for a minute, as we wait on him and then pray. Father, you are so magnificent. The majesty of your person. The majesty of the one who walks above the whelming flood. The one who walks where he sees and is able to work in every circumstance and every situation where those things that are seen are being transformed. The things that are being seen are becoming vital parts of all who are and who continue to live as his. We thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for what you've said and done. We're thankful for your grace to us. We ask you to bless us as we sing these final songs or hymns. And let us rejoice in the King who's coming. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing. While you're standing, now is the time with the service about over for me to pray for those that are having surgery, and those that are in need of healing, and those that are in need of his touch today. Uh, how many surgeries have got coming up here? You got right there. And it's, uh, oh, all right. And uh, Robin's doing good. Yeah, he sounds really good. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, just walk in quiet and don't shake things up to him. <laughs> no, you got to be there for him, and you've been there, so he appreciates that a lot. And I know uh, he want us. He doesn't want us to mess things up either. So, is that everybody has got surgery coming up? Okay, let's pray, and then we'll close the service. Who was Nancy? Yeah, Nancy is having surgery, twentieth, I believe, isn't it? Yeah. Okay? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for the body of Christ. For the body of Christ. And I know that when we say that and pray, we might be praying for a cathedral full of people or a baseball stadium or more people than we could even begin to count for such. But it doesn't really matter because everywhere the true representation of the body of Christ stands, the whole of the body of Christ around the world is one with us. And we believe that's a very important part of seeing what we, what we are, who we are. So I ask you to heal these who are being uh, operated on the surgical situations that are coming up. Uh, some of them I know are, are day surgeries. Some may be other things beyond that. We just lift them up to you today. Each name called, each person represented by that recognition in this congregation. Bless them, keep them, and when they... Go in for surgery, let them have such peace that there will be no question, no doubt that they have the presence of God in their, in their heart and in their place. And I thank you, Lord, for that. Bless them. We pray for the rest of us and all of us together that we might be able to represent you aright this week and that your name might be exalted and we might see the glory of your presence. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. 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 You got surrenders over here. I know that's when you when the first people that do it are surrendering. But it's too late to surrender. We've already yelled this into place. So here we are. Receive the blessing of God here as we celebrate. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Heavenly Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all today, this week, and forevermore in Jesus' name.